Real-time scheduling is a complex topic. In this video, we'll consider some of the practicalities we have to deal with when developing real-time embedded systems. First, let's think about some of the assumptions we've made in developing our models of scheduling. RMS assumes that context switching takes zero time. Of course, that's not true. Scheduling executes instructions, which takes CPU time, which is time that's not available to the processes themselves. If we need to calculate an exact schedule, we would have to take this scheduling overhead into account. But we'll see that in many cases, it's a small fraction of the total execution time, and so scheduling overhead can be ignored. Let's think for just a moment about what RMS and EDF need to do in order to schedule. RMS scans the processes and chooses the highest priority ready process. That time is linear in the number of processes. EDF takes each process, computes the time to the deadline, and then chooses the highest priority process based on that criterion. That takes more time than RMS. Non-zero context switch times can push the limit of a very tight schedule. And it can be hard to calculate the effects, in part because it depends on context switches, particularly when we take into account the cache. But in practice, context switch time is a few hundred clock cycles. And task periods are often microseconds to milliseconds. So we can often ignore the effects of context switching. However, if we're very concerned about the accuracy of the schedule, we can use an RTOS simulator to help us analyze the situation. Some RTOS vendors provide simulators that can simulate execution time of the processes, context switching time, and other effects such as interrupts. We give the simulator a set of inputs that drive the simulation, and the simulator gives us the resulting schedule and what happens at each time point. What happens if we find that our set of processes is unschedulable for whatever reason? whether it be context switching time or simply that we're trying to do too much work. Well, it may be possible to negotiate a change in the deadlines. However, it's important to emphasize that embedded programmers shouldn't do this on their own. They need to negotiate such changes with the application designers. We could also try to optimize the code for the processes to reduce their execution time. Or we could get a faster CPU. Which is the best approach depends upon the situation. RMS and EDF assume that tasks are independent. That's usually not the case. They have to cooperate with each other to get useful work done. Let's consider issues that come up when we have interacting tasks. Some task sets have data dependencies between the processes. So for instance, in this case, P1 has to run and produce some data that is consumed by P2. Data dependencies are good because they help us restrict the combination of processes that can run at the same time. For example, we know that P1 and P2 can't run simultaneously because P1 needs to finish before P2 can start. We also know that P3 can preempt either P1 or P2, but not both of them. Another very important source of interactions between processes is I.O. I.O. is very important to understand because interrupts that drive I.O. are controlled by hardware, not software. The priorities of the processes are determined by the operating system, which is software. The priorities of interrupts are determined by hardware, and that hardware overrides whatever the software is doing. Interrupt handling has non-zero latency and that latency takes away from whatever the operating system is doing. We can use this sequence diagram to understand what's happening. A task is executing, a device interrupts. That causes the interrupt handler to be executed. We then have to go to the kernel to decide what task should run next. In order to minimize the amount of time that's spent in the hardware-driven interrupt routine, we often divide interrupt handling into two levels of service. The first level is what's often called the interrupt service handler, or ISH. That's the actual handler that's called by the interrupt, and it's designed to only do a minimum amount of work. 
The rest of the work that's required to handle the interrupt in full is done by a separate routine called the interrupt service routine or ISR. That is a process that's controlled by the operating system and so it does not interfere with the normal processes of scheduling. At a higher level of abstraction, interactions between processes can cause an effect known as priority inversion, in which a low priority process keeps a high priority process from running. This can happen when they share some resource, such as an I.O. device. So, for example, the low priority process grabs the I.O. device and starts to operate on it. Those operations can't be interrupted by something else. Now let's say a high priority process starts to run and it needs the same I.O. device, but it can't get it until the low priority process is finished with the I.O. device and releases it for use by other processes. But the low priority process can't release it because it can't execute because it's been preempted by the high priority process. The result, in some cases, is deadlock. We can solve priority inversion by changing the way we assign priorities. Basically, we can have a process inherit the priority of the resource that it requests. So a low priority process would temporarily get a higher priority that ensures that it will be able to execute long enough in order to finish its work with the shared resource. Processes can also interact in the cache. We know that caches affect execution time, and this can bubble up to the level of scheduling. When a process executes, it changes what's in the cache, and the operating system itself will affect the cache. So for example, here's a very simple cache. Let's say we have two processes and the operating system. Process one occupies this part of the cache. The kernel executes this part of the cache. So during a context switch, the kernel will kick out part of the contents of the cache from P1. And then if P2 occupies the same part of the cache, it will kick out the kernel, which had in turn kicked out P1. So now when P1 executes again, it will kick out that old data. And so these, and so these processes thrash in the cache. The position of code in memory is controlled by the linker. And so the location of the code determines where it lies in the cache. By properly choosing the code locations and the cache placement, we can reduce these kinds of cache interference. We can't totally eliminate all cache interference, but we can reduce it. So, for example, let's say we redesign our program so that P1 occupies this part of the cache. Put the kernel in this part of the cache and put P2 in this part of the cache. Now they can all share the cache without interfering with each other. Low power design is an essential part of embedded system design. Let's think about how low power affects scheduling. We have to deal with low power concerns in scheduling in very different ways depending on how our chip consumes power. If we're only concerned with dynamic power consumption, then the chip consumes power only when it's doing useful work. When it's idle, it's not consuming power. In this case, we can take advantage of dynamic voltage and frequency scaling. We can find the lowest clock rate at which the processes will meet their deadlines and then adjust the power supply voltage and the clock rate to that value. But many systems consume static power. That means they're burning power even when they're not doing useful work. The only way to stop the power consumption is to turn off the CPU. This pushes us to a scheduling methodology that's become known as race to dark. We want to run as fast as possible so that we can turn off the CPU and stop the pet static power consumption. So static and dynamic power consumption models lead us to very different ways to think about low power scheduling. A power manager that was developed for PCs and is used in many systems is known as ACPI. ACPI provides services that the operating system can call upon to implement its policy. ACPI defines several different power states. For example, G3 is mechanical off, meaning that there's a switch that has turned off all power to the system. G2 is a soft off state where there's maybe a few components in standby. G1 is a sleep mode, 
and G0 is working. To summarize, our scheduling models assume, for example, that context switching takes zero time. That's not true, but we can deal with matters like that in the design of our systems. We do have to deal with issues like priority inversion when we have tasks that interact with each other. And when we're designing low power systems, we have to think carefully about how scheduling affects the power consumption of our systems.